1. The Fort Chapter 1. Astrid During the 1950s, supreme self-confidence in a girl was not a virtue, nor was superior intelligence, natural beauty, and height. Astrid Sims was a head taller than every thirteen-year-old boy in school, except for Will Guilford, who would become a high school basketball center in four years as a freshman. In addition, Astrid spoke with a British accent, which gave her an air of superiority. Linda Harrison, the most popular girl in class, thought Astrid was haughty and mimicked her among Linda's followers. Despite her long red ponytail, bony cheeks, narrow nose, and full lips, the boys thought she looked like an Amazon, like Wonder Woman in the comic books. They did not have the temerity to call her an Amazon, and no one called her a smarty pants or a show-off except behind her back. She intimidated her classmates and even some of her teachers with her intellect. They didn't know quite what to do with her. The school principal and his staff recommended skipping her two grades, but her parents did not agree. They would have none of it. Our daughter's socialization at her age and peer level is more important, they said. The task of socialization penetrated the lives of four unsuspecting boys, Clement Peterson, Stephen Tillman, Eddie DeVito, and Ray Kern. They had no choice in the decision, because she chose them. They learned early on that you didn't argue with Astrid. No one did. Not even adults. If they tried, they would lose. All of those associations and characteristic behaviors of Astrid did not arise until later, within one week of fall semester. As a new student from out of town, she didn't waste time trying to negotiate and maneuver the cliques so necessary to the self-identity of insecure youth in their emerging adolescent culture. Avoiding the catty, chattering girl section of the cafeteria, she barged right in and sat down at the segregated boys' private lunch table, the one they sat at every day, each in his own designated chair. I, she said, I'm Astrid Sims. She dragged an empty plastic chair over from a neighboring table, a move that brought scowls from the eight boys seated there. That chair's taken, said one of the eight. Oh, I don't see anybody. There's another empty chair he can have. And with her single action, she made instant enemies of the occupants at that table. Not knowing how to respond, the four chosen boys overcame their initial shock at her breach of etiquette by becoming intensely preoccupied with their lunch meat and cheese sandwiches, potato chips, chocolate cookies pressed around white cream, and pint cartons of milk to avoid eye contact with this interloper. Her lunch bag claimed territory on the tabletop, and she sat down. Glancing sideways, the boys unsuccessfully tried to repress their curiosity as to what food she had. They considered her an alien. Sensing their interest, she removed the foil wrap on her soft white bread sandwich, lifted the top, and inserted a pickle slice, allowing them to glimpse the ham and cheese content. Preferring bologna to ham, the boys nevertheless acknowledged the ham as being close enough to lunch meat with cheddar cheese to be acceptable. She also had potato chips, another plus, but no cream-filled chocolate cookies. She had chocolate chip instead, which was okay. She had an apple, also okay, and a carton of milk with a straw from the cafeteria line. So at least she might be normal after all. Only time would tell. They hoped she might disengage herself from them, but soon learned that was not about to happen. For about three minutes they all chewed, slurped, and swallowed. Then she asked an alarming question. Do you boys make your own lunch? Jaws ceased to chomp. Facial expressions froze. She had addressed them like an adult. 
She had called them boys. I make my own lunch every day. I can select from a variety of options, or I can order from the lunch line. Do you boys always bring your own lunch, or do you sometimes buy from the lunch line? I study the weekly menu in advance and then make a decision. There. She did it again. She called them boys, not guys. Boys. They would never admit that they depended on their mothers to make their lunches. But then she put them on the spot, embarrassed them with the obvious question. Do your mothers make your lunches? The boys quietly nodded as though they were being interrogated, which they were, Astrid's method of being dominant. So, she said, now that I've introduced myself, what are your names? We're all in the same class. When none of them responded, she said with a smile, don't be shy, I don't bite. Her comment caused them to further withdraw. Only adults said things like that. She was supposed to be a kid. Okay. It's a game. Let me guess. I heard Mrs. Grierson say your names at roll call, and I saw you raise your hands. Let's see if I can remember. You're Stephen Tillman. You're Clement Peterson. You're Eddie DeVito, and you're Ray Kern. Their expressions of astonishment reflected her triumphant grin. Logic always works, she said. Go ahead. You don't have to stop eating. She took another bite of her sandwich and surveyed them. They crunched chips and cookies as though she had granted them permission to continue. I was just wondering what you boys like to do after school. Astonished at her further invasion of their privacy, in the sanctity of their after-school hours, Stephen muttered, Homework. Homework? Do you like to do homework? I can help you with that any time, in any subject. We don't need help, said Clement. In case you do, I'm available. You probably don't really do homework right after school. That would actually be boring. What about sports? We don't play sports that girls can do. Well, I can do anything. You just have to show me once. I probably do sports you don't know about. Have you ever heard of cricket and field hockey? Isn't cricket like baseball? Surprising even himself. Eddie unexpectedly joined the conversation. Cricket uses a different kind of bat. It's flat and a wooden ball. The players don't wear gloves either, except for the catcher. Emma's hurt their hands, said Ray. They're tough. They're used to it. You play that? asked Stephen. They did let me play once. I whacked the ball too hard so they wouldn't let me play again. I played field hockey, though, and soccer all the time. My team liked me because I scored a lot, and I was a good sport. We made goals because of good teamwork. Is that like hockey but not on ice? asked Clement. Astrid's lips curled up in a grin of appreciation. She was gaining their interest. It's played on grass, thereby the term field. I could have told you that, said Eddie, in an impulse to curry favor he didn't understand. I know it's not on ice. Clement's sarcastic tone caught Eddie unaware. Insults and sarcasm peppered their discussions as commonplace and accepted. But this topic, with a girl at the table, had an underlying competitive implication that was new to the boys. Clement was especially sensitive, since he had just turned thirteen a week ago. He was the youngest of the group, and they didn't let him forget it. Partly because of his side, they called him Runt. He was shorter than his friends, but faster. As a lightweight, he could outrun all of them, a factor in his becoming a leading competitor in high school track two years later. He believed keeping his erratic blonde hair cut short gave him greater speed, planning to join the high school wrestling team as a freshman 
Eddie had been weight training since he was ten under the guidance of his father, a detective in the local police department. Jim DeVito aspired to have a body like Charles Atlas as seen in magazine ads and passed along the importance of manliness to his son. A closet intellectual, Ray Kern observed his friends and other classmates with a droll expression of amusement. He liked to think of himself as being above and outside the fray, and let his brown curls grow long over his ears and down the back of his neck, just to be different. His liberal-oriented parents did not object. He maintained a close personal involvement with his friends, whom he entertained with science fiction stories he was writing about imaginary future worlds. He also had them hooked on ritual viewings of the Twilight Zone. Ray was the only member of the group whose family owned a television set. Slung over the couch and sprawled on Ray's living room floor, they were mesmerized by the bizarre supernatural worlds that haunted the lives of ordinary people like themselves. From the first day they met her, Astrid Sims intrigued him as a creature from the Twilight Zone who attached herself to them and became an unshakable part of their lives. The moment the clapper rattled the metallic jangle of the school bell, the students erupted from their desks and charged for the doors in barely contained disciplined files. The stream of youths flowed out of classrooms and merged into the hallways like a swarm of lemmings in an unerring rush for freedom. Punctuated by screams, the yelling, shouting, chattering children burst through the main doors and scattered across the blacktop to waiting yellow school buses and mothers in parked cars. Astrid maneuvered through the crowd to a cluster of bicycle racks. Placing her books in her bike basket, she watched Stephen, Ray, Eddie, and Clement sling on their backpacks, mount their bikes, and charge through the mass confusion of bodies. Keeping the boys in sight, she followed them at a discreet distance. Their vigorous pumping of legs and feet and racing speed indicated they wanted to outdistance her. Since she was riding a full-size boy's bike with large circumference balloon tires, she had no trouble keeping up with them. They dropped their bikes at the Tillman backyard and scrambled up the ladder into their tree fort. Astrid arrived moments later. Straddling her bike, she looked up at them and shouted so they would notice her. Hey! I like your treehouse. Their faces popped up at the cutout windows. What are you doing here? Stephen shouted down at her. We didn't invite you. Besides, this isn't a treehouse. It's a fort. Did you build it yourselves? Yeah, we built it ourselves. How, how else do you think it got built? Stephen snapped down at her. It looks so professional. I was just wondering. Stephen shot a warning glance at his friends not to say anything about his father's assistance as a master carpenter. We've got tools, Eddie shouted. We know how to use them. I just want to admire your handiwork, Astrid waved at them, glaring down at her from two of the side-cut windows. You can't come up here. You can't come up here, shouted Stephen. You're not wearing the right kind of clothes. He referred to her shin-length pleated skirt, saddle shoes, rolled bobby socks, and blouse with puffed sleeves. Ignoring them, she climbed up the ladder and poked her head through the trapdoor entrance. This looks ace! Blinding! Thinking she was insulting them, Stephen shot back. What does that mean? Oh, you wouldn't know. Fantastic. Stupendous. Around here we say things are cool. Cool it is, mates. Or not mates. This ain't a ship. Okay, boys. Your treehouse is cool. It's not a treehouse. It's a fort. Stephen's vituperative correction reddened his tense face. But do you know what you need? We don't need anything, said Stephen. Yes, you do. You need a doorbell. No, we don't. Who would ring a doorbell anyway? We're the only ones who can come up here. A doorbell is a finishing touch and can lend an air of mystery. There's no mystery about a doorbell, said Stephen. 
you won't know until you have one. A mystery can be unknown until you discover it. We don't need a mystery. See, it's just like I told you. As soon as you say there isn't one, that means there is. You made it happen. Now we just have to find out what it is. You sound like a nut, said Stephen. First we have to get a doorbell. Then we can begin to solve the mystery. You don't have anything to say about our fort. We don't need a doorbell, and we don't want one, and we don't want you hanging around. Oh, listen, you can't tell me what I can and can't do. This is a free country. This fort is private property. You're trespassing. That's against the law. Astrid laughed. The day will come when you'll be thankful I'm here. First, you have to remove the blinders from your eyes. Listen yourself, Astrid. You're on my property. I live here. Eddie's dad is a cop. He can call him and have you arrested for trespassing. Oh, Tosh, aren't you a wazzock? What's a wazzock? An idiot? How dare you call me an idiot? You have no sense of imagination. We don't need yours. A creative thought flashed into Ray Kern's mind. I think she might be right. A doorbell is a good idea. His friend scowled at him. Astrid beamed. She had an ally. Well, I'm not going to get a doorbell, said Stephen. I'll get one, said Astrid. It will be my contribution to your... She hesitated. Fort. You don't need to do anything to our fort, said Stephen. It's just a doorbell, said Ray. What harm can it do? It won't cost you anything, said Astrid. We can just have fun with it. Fun ringing a doorbell? Are you nuts? We can pretend it's a magic bell. It will make our fort magical. You are nuts, and it's not your fort. It's our fort. What world do you come from? Astrid laughed. The same one you're in. I don't think so. I'm just having fun, Stephen, just like all of you. Well, I'm not since you came along, and you aren't magical. Her smiling eyes took in all four boys. You never know. Cheers. <laughs>